What is up y'all? This is Alexander with guns.com back at you guys again. Here we've got a couple of really cool picks. I got five firearms that I find especially interesting and cool. Working here at the big warehouse, we see a lot of things come in, a lot of cool things go out. And just wanted to highlight some of those really unique and awesome firearms that uh, don't really get to see too often. Whether you're a fan of 1980s action movies or if you're complaining about how overpowered this shotgun is in Call of Duty, this is a pretty recognizable platform. This is the Franke Spaz 12. Spaz stands for uh, Sporting Purpose Automatic Shotgun. One of the reasons why they changed it to that nomenclature was to try to get it imported into the United States under the guise of it being a, a sporting purpose shotgun. However, this was designed specifically with law enforcement in mind. It's a very unique operating system. One of the cool things about it is it switches between pump action and semi-auto fairly easily. I'll show you here. On the bottom, there is a button. All you have to do is depress that button and move it forward to move it into semi-automatic or move it to the rearward position and it is a pump action shotgun. One of the major benefits of having a gun that's both semi-automatic and uh, pump action is from a law enforcement application, uh, it's a gun that you're going to use lethal ammunition and non-lethal ammunition. Lethal ammunition being high brass, uh, higher velocity, cycles well through the semi-auto, while non-lethal ammunition like bean bags or pepper balls are too low velocity to really cycle the action. So it gives the shooter the ability to manually run the shotgun well and quickly. They're unique because of this uh, tail hook here on the end. Although they were made in two different um, configurations, we have the full stock configuration here as well as this tail hook. The interesting thing about the tail hook is it was designed so that it kind of folds out to the side, giving the shooter kind of that support where he can fire the shotgun with one hand bracing it against his forearm. Something that we would see uh, later forwarded in with pistol braces uh, with different platforms way in the future after this uh, was not imported in the United States. These are pretty rare shotguns. There weren't a lot of them, less than 2,000 of them imported into the United States, a little more difficult to get your hands on, and uh, it's pretty cool to, uh, to get to see one in person, and this is something that we have available here at guns.com. So if you're gonna hunt velociraptors or just want a cool sporting shotgun, be sure to check this out. As a continuation, kind of moving past that Spaz 12 here, here we have a Franke Law 12. Uh, this one here is pretty much the exact same thing as a SPAS-12 from the receiver back. However, it has a different function here in the front. In uh, 1980, Franke wanted to kind of sell this alongside the SPAS-12 as some police forces might not want a firearm that they could move back and forth between two operating functions. They just wanted something that was simple, would run high brass loads no matter what. Uh, something interesting about this firearm, as opposed to the SPAS-12, is it does have a magazine disconnect right here. Um, that's kind of a weird, almost World War I or pre-World War I feature. But the purpose of that is if a law enforcement individual did need to run a special load of ammunition, they could disconnect feeding from the magazine and single load special cartridges into the firearm. For 1980, this was pretty cool because it was lightweight semi-automatic and it held eight rounds in the tube making it uh, something that was just a little more tactical uh, over a lot of the other options that were available at the time. A lot of the parts for this are interchangeable with the SPAS-12. These are a little more common in the United States but it's just kind of cool to see that evolution move from the SPAS-12 into this and then later on Firearms like the Benelli M4 and M1 would dominate the semi-automatic uh, market. But this is just a cool iteration in the history of the semi-automatic shotgun and uh, something really awesome to take a look at that you don't really get to see. Both the SPAS-12 and the LAW-12 uh, ceased importation in the United States in 1989 and 1994 under the uh, bills that were passed during that time. So it's been well over uh, 30 years for one of them and, and coming up here on, uh, on 30 years for the other since these have been imported into the United States. They're no longer manufactured, kind of a rare find and something that's 
drying up out there on the uh, on the market. So something cool that you get to see that you wouldn't necessarily get to look at in a regular circumstance. Next up here, we have a very unique and uh, kind of rare find. Now, if I was to say the word Husqvarna to you, you would probably think of chainsaws, lawn mowers, weed whackers, but believe it or not, Husqvarna made firearms for uh, the country of Sweden back in the day. This here is an example of that. Kind of looks like a Luger, and that's uh, a firearm that uh, a lot of people kind of put up in an iconic status. However, it's pretty different than a Luger. The only thing it has in common is, is kind of the overall shape and the cartridge that is chambered in. Um, this is based off of the Lottie M35, which was a, a pistol the Finnish military used, trying to get away from their stockpile of Russian and purchased German firearms, getting into something that was definitely made by some of the countries like Sweden and Finland, their own stockpile, something they could pull from, develop, uh, and produce instead of being reliant on other countries. This was a handgun that was made with a uh, Bergman Bayard action. A Bergman Bayard pistol is very common in, uh, in World War I, kind of that early 1900s era. And it's a very nice, smooth action. And these are kind of just unique because of the way that they work. Uh, this was getting into a more standardized caliber, 9 millimeter being the dominant caliber of the time. Uh, but early in the 1900s, there were so many pistol calibers out there, and uh, the ad adaptation of 9mm in firearms like this in countries like Sweden and Finland, which weren't necessarily big players in World War II, uh, that kind of helped solidify the future of the 9mm cartridge. Uh, this one here, it comes with the original Swedish holster. It's even <coughs> marked with the three crowns. Uh, it's very old and just a really cool and unique piece of history that kind of goes under the radar as it wasn't in service as much as the Luger, the 1911, but still served a big purpose. In fact, it was so well built that these stayed in service in Swedish military up until the mid-1980s. Uh, but just another unique thing, kind of an odd thing, but really awesome to get to see in person. Here we have two firearms that have a couple of things in common and are also kind of complete opposites. Uh, this is a Sterling Mark IV that's been pretty highly modified and here we have a PPS-43, a Polish PPS-43. The interesting thing about both of these is this right here is a firearm design that comes from World War II, uh, from the British and Commonwealth side while this firearm also comes from World War II and from the Soviet side. Uh, the other thing that they have in common, which is interesting, is they're both chambered in 7.62 by 25 Tokarev. It's a pretty zippy cartridge. Um, it's really awesome, makes for a great submachine gun cartridge, gives a little more oomph and power to the shooter, maybe a little more range, uh, some accuracy, and it's a cartridge that's pretty readily available out there in large surplus quantities but a lot of fun to shoot, definitely. Um, the PPS-43 here, uh, a lot of people think that this is just a skeletonized version of the PPSH-41. However, it is not. This is pretty much much different than you would see in the PPSH-41. Uh, the PPSH-41 was designed by uh, Spagen. This one is a design by Sudayev. And um, it's a little more simplified, making the manufacturing process quicker and cheaper. And it also doesn't take those drum magazines that you would see in a, in a PPSH-41. This one here is, I mean, it was a Sterling. It's not really a Sterling anymore. It's pretty short, and uh, it's in this interesting cartridge. Uh, but still a really awesome, unique thing that you just wouldn't run into too many times. It takes a 32-round magazine. And both of these guns kind of have a little bit of that historical aspect to it, whilst also being a really awesome candidate to take to the range and just have some fun with. So just something unique that I thought, uh, thought I'd show you guys. Well, as you can see, these are just a couple of the really cool things that we have coming through our warehouse. If you guys have anything at home that you're looking to sell, be sure to check out our We Buy Guns program. 
And uh, if you guys are in the market for something cool, we have a huge selection of used firearms that come through. So be sure to check us out on guns.com. Uh, thanks for watching this, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. We'll catch you guys later.